The story of Australia's first peoples is the oldest continuing human story on Earth. Through countless generations of songlines, to connection with country and spirit, to resistance, struggle and survival, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander story is vast, inspiring and always evolving. This podcast series presents a collection of First Peoples voices, sharing their experiences, achievements, hopes and beliefs. These are the real stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. Hi, I'm Mayra Santa, and you're listening to The Real Podcast Series. In this episode, I'll be chatting with Darumbal Murray and Tongan woman Makesha Masella. Makesha is a talented singer-songwriter, social entrepreneur and political activist who frequently speaks about contemporary issues which impact on young Aboriginal people. Makesha is the 2019 National NAIDOC Youth of the Year and the first Indigenous Australian to be accepted into an undergraduate degree at the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music at New York University. Makesha Masella, thank you very much for joining us here at The Real Podcast, which yeah. we're super excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. Um, it's all our pleasure and we can't wait to hear some of the background of your story and kind of what's coming up next for you. Yeah. But um, I always like to get our guests to introduce themselves because I could read your bio and anyone could do that online but okay. um, we want to hear what you want to share about yourself and how you'd like to introduce your introduce your mob. Okay um, my name is Makesha. I am freshly 18 so I'm kind of going into a new season of re-self-discovery of, n- of being not sure of who I am or but at the same time probably the most sure that I've ever been. Um, I'm a proud Jurumbal Tongan woman, um, born and raised here in Sydney, and I couldn't be any more proud of my culture um, and my people as well. And also seeing my family grow up and sort of explore their identities as well. Um, But I'm a musician, a singer, songwriter, but I think, like I said before, I'm growing into something a little bit more now. I feel like I'm growing into... Maybe you could call it a social entrepreneur. I'm just learning a lot more about the world and my people and my role as a musician and just as a human being to be able to move forward as a country and as one people. Well, I'm glad I didn't try to introduce you. That was beautifully (laughs) put together. And to think that you're entering that next phase of your life at just 18. um, I think I should probably let all the listeners out there know that I've known you since you're a little girl. Yeah, since Um, I was a (laughs) bubba. Since you were a little bubba. And I think when this goes out, I might have to share some of those cute... I think I've got some pictures of you in a belly dancing outfit back in the day. So (laughs) that'll be nice, depending on how this interview kind of goes along the way. Um, But I'm certainly very proud of you as your family and the whole community are in the amazing young woman that you are becoming, mm. that you already are and that you are growing into. You've, as you said, just finished high school and you smashed it out of the park in terms of all your schooling. Yeah. Um, you were the school captain. Yeah. And you got a bunch <laughs> of prizes for the HSC as well, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I don't know, I've always loved school, but um, in my few final years, I kind of got a new appreciation for my school, particularly just the privilege of being able to learn and be in a safe place every day. So I kind of just thrived in the last few years, just loved my teachers, loved my friends, loved what I was learning. Um, My class was the first year to um, have Aboriginal studies offered as a course for the HSC. So I took that opportunity as quickly as I could. Um, Other than that, just like did as much music as I possibly could. Um, got super involved and engaged in the community and I guess that just created the perfect environment for me to thrive and feel comfortable in my learning and to be able to push the boundaries a little bit and push myself. And so with the Aboriginal Studies, did you have anything to do with that, becoming part of the um, curriculum at your school? I guess, yeah, I think I would say so. Um, The previous head girl or school captain um, who was a close friend of mine had the conversation with the principal about introducing it as part of the senior years in their courses. And I guess every person who put their hand up to um, take part in the course had a big part in it actually being offered, which was probably cool having other non-Indigenous kids in my grade support that as well and actually be willing to learn about Australia's history and its people and contemporary issues facing Indigenous people. So it was pretty cool, not only just for me to have the opportunity to learn about it, but to also have peers come along on that journey with me and be willing to sort of 
challenge their what they think Australia was about and to sort of gain a new perspective. There must have been an interesting classroom. Yeah, totally. But it was definitely my favourite class out of all of them. And so were there any moments where you kind of, the penny dropped or you thought, oh, this is making a difference um, in terms of having these conversations in the classroom? Mm, I, well, I guess you could say straight up, most of the kids were quite woke with you know, some apostrophes or whatever you call them. Um, I hate that word, but um, most of the kids were quite educated or at least had an open mind to learn about things that the average Australian maybe doesn't want to know about. Um, But I thought I went into the course thinking that, you know, I'd be the big shot, I'd know everything, but actually um, it was quite challenging to keep up and to keep a good rank and to get good grades in the class because kids actually were quite politically and socially aware of what was happening with Indigenous people and what had happened. Mm-hmm. Um, despite that, though, there were a few conversations that we had that were a little bit frustrating when, you know, like me being an Indigenous person who's in the community every day and who understands issues and has to sort of evolve with them as they change every day because, you know, in community nothing stays the same ever. Things are always evolving and changing quickly. So I guess when someone wasn't well informed on something and they had an opinion on it, it was kind of hard to challenge that as well as being supportive of them and their own learning journey when it comes to Indigenous issues. Yeah, you were taking that on for um, on behalf of your teammates or your you yeah. know, classmates at the same time. And yeah. there, are, there are moments like that that you get presented with issues where you're like, I find it when racism pops up. Yeah. You just It's unexpected and it comes mm-hmm. at you and you're quite, not quite sure what the toolkit is to yeah. respond to that. And I'm often yeah. dumbfounded mm-hmm. um, in those moments. Were there any moments where you kind of had to have some of those tricky conversations in the classroom? And do you remember how you got through those? I think it's just when it came to the the issue of trying to justify why things are how they are today but not making excuses for people in their personal lives it's so hard because you can see the intergenerational trauma in front of you but then people challenge that and say but why can't they just behave this way why can't they just do this why can't they just get a job and keep it it's hard to explain those complex issues that even myself I'm still learning Mm -hmm. and trying to wrap my head around and so I guess that's where I got frustrated not so much with the other person but just with a little bit more with myself of not knowing how to answer that question when really it's not my responsibility to have all the answers about everything regarding Indigenous peoples because there's literally like hundreds of thousands of us that I can only speak for myself so there came a point where I just had to go I actually don't know the answer to this question, but I know that where you're coming from is probably not as well informed as it should be. Yeah, and that's okay in life that you just don't know the answers to questions all the time. It took me a while to learn that one, but it's kind of good that you learnt that one early. And and I always remember at school when teachers would say, I don't know the answers to that. And you just had so much more respect for them because they weren't kind of being the big noter and knowing it all all the time. So, But how lucky that you got to do Aboriginal studies at school and have those kind of complex conversations. Totally. Um, And I know that's kind of influenced some of the decisions um, around you kind of working in community, being on some um, youth boards and that sort of thing. So can you tell us about some of your um, kind of youth work um, that you're doing out there with various organisations? Yeah. So um, I am on the project advisory committee for a new centre being built in Western Sydney, which is called the Kimberwali Centre. And it's, it's been completely chopped and changed throughout the process Um, But one thing that we've been 100% sure of the whole way is that we want to promote excellence in our community, within our community, and then also reach outwards and show the rest of Sydney and mainly the Western Sydney community just how freaking incredible our people are and what we're capable of. And so I guess having the centre is going to be a hub of kids from all different backgrounds, all different cultures, because, you know, not all kids are just Koori, not all kids are just Indigenous. We often are mixed or just coming from different places from around Australia. Most of us, um, most of my community have been born and raised in Sydney, but nowadays we have lots of people moving from regional far western New South Wales or even Queensland. I know there's lots of Murrays down here, so we have lots of family around, which is great. 
but it's just supposed to be a centre where all differences are put aside and everyone just focuses on building themselves and their families and their communities. And why do you think it's important to promote that excellence? And I like how you put it both internally to the community and outward facing. Why Mm. do you think that's important? I think maybe a few decades ago, the the image of an Indigenous person or the perception of who an Indigenous person was was quite different to what it was today. And often that that perception would be something that would reflect the stereotype. And so I guess today we're lucky that we have young people who are really passionate about their culture and really strong in their identities and they can see the excellence in our elders, in even in our younger leaders, our emerging leaders. So we just want to push that as far as we possibly can to make sure that in the generations to come that our kids can only see excellence and Indigenous people thriving in the contemporary society, I guess you could call it. But yeah, just that that setting up the future for our young people so that what has happened in the past never happens again. Whew. Um, I, I love that you say young people at 18. Um, it's just <laughs> there's obviously a very steady head on your shoulders and I'm um, just proud listening to this conversation already. Um, with, uh, I suppose one thing on the reel is we want to hear young people's stories from your perspective um, mm. and there are probably some challenges out there for young people um, that we're quite not, not across, we mm. aren't aware of. What yeah. are some of the issues that you think as a young Aboriginal person that you come across that's quite challenging to you? I think something that I have encountered for my whole life and will probably continue to encounter for the rest of my life is the perception of who I'm supposed to be. So, not who I am supposed to be, but who people think I'm supposed to be. So often, um, maybe not so much now, but in the past I've been teased for being too well-spoken for an Indigenous woman, which is kind of stupid, if you ask me. Um, Or there's the conversation about how Aboriginal you are, how many halves, how many quarters are you, when really that's actually irrelevant. And I think that's something that continues to kind of plague our young people is that validation of who am I? Who am I? My auntie's telling me who I am, but my friend at school who is, you know, Australian, white Australian is telling me this about my culture. And it's kind of hard to put the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out exactly who you are when really the answer is just within you and you get you get to decide who you are. But yeah, it's just always, it's that constant battle of trying to justify yourself to other people when really you don't have to. But that feeling in the moment is like, I I have to do this for my people. I have to make sure that these people know where I come from, why I'm here, um, why I'm speaking on this issue from this perspective. Like there's just so many, I guess it depends on the context or the situation, but it always comes from from other people and their expectations on you, whether that's they expect you to do well, do well, do better because of certain benefits that you might get, or they expect you to do worse because of the stereotype. So, yeah, it just it's so complex that I couldn't even delve into it without talking for hours on end. But yeah, it's interesting though. I don't think anyone would realize that that Aboriginal people are constantly trying to. Um, walk all these paths in life and dealing yeah. not only with who you, you are, mm. where, where we sit as Aboriginal people in this country or in mm. your classroom or, you know, totally. you, you can just be you, Makesha, yeah. take away all the labels yeah. um, and just make you happy and share your talents with the world totally. as opposed to exactly. having to worry about all those boxes that are floating around and getting exactly. in the way of the clear thinking of doing what you want to do to mm. kind of be... Um, whatever you want to be in the future. Yeah, and I guess the hardest part about that is everything that I am is Indigenous and Aboriginal and it's like embedded in my identity, but at the same time, I'm just Makesha. Like sometimes that label can be kind of destructive to people's view of you, Mm -hmm. which kind of sucks. I wish people could just strip away all of the prejudice, all of the preconceived ideas, and just look at me as me, a strong Indigenous Tongan woman who loves music, who loves her family, and also loves coffee. <laughs> <laughs> when you just shared before we came online that you've only had one coffee today, but that's yeah. what you limit yourself to. Yeah. But you were concerned, um, you're concerned about your caffeine intake, yes. which is good, your health. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good that you introduce a little bit about your family. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about... Um, 
you grew up in Sydney mm-hmm. um, and obviously family from uh, uh, Murray's and Tongan, yeah. part of the family. How, how is it like? What is it like at home? What's that melting pot like? And um, you've got a gorgeous sister. Tell us about yeah. the family. So it's just mum, dad, my sister and I. My little sister's um, just started year nine this year. She's 14 and she's like a little woman now which is so funny. She's like talks back. She thinks that she knows, she thinks that she's grown. She thinks that she can get around by herself, but she's the cutest. And she's honestly like the most frustrating, but I honestly don't love anyone more than I love my sister. So Mm. she's like, I don't know. It's just like siblings, like you get it. Like Mm. you either love them or you hate them or you can love them and hate them at the same time. Um, But I guess like my family and my culture has just been like, how it is at home like I've always had that side the Tongan side where we eat Tongan food and it's like dancing traditional Tongan dancing Tongan music and I guess part of that was kind of difficult balancing my identities not not necessarily but again it came to that perception of being Tongan indigenous and then not fitting the stereotype of what either of those cultures kind of are Mm -hmm. And then when it came to my Indigenous culture, it always just meant community, being surrounded by people who genuinely are invested in you and care for you, or you could have no blood relation, no no um, family relation whatsoever, but people are still rooting for you and people will support you 100%, which I think is something so powerful that not many other cultures in the world have. And even just being like the strongest people in the world to have survived so much in the past and to have overcome that and now we're all standing independently and doing our best to succeed in the Western society, which is another challenge that, another conversation that, you know, we could delve into for hours is that thing of balancing traditional culture as well as being sort of having, yeah, like too many fingers in different pies. Like you want to be completely invested in your family and knowing your culture and all that sort of stuff. But when it comes to setting up your life and having a job or going to uni, sometimes you have to sacrifice some of those things or you miss out on important milestones in your cultural and family identity. So that's, yeah, like another completely different conversation. I think that's the trick to being your age, just trying to juggle and figure figure those things out. And there are different times in your life where lots of things come at you and you learn to be new roles as you go. Um, And um, I think I've talked about auntie michelle obama before but that concept of becoming and evolving and you know um is just part of life's journey more broadly um but uh one of the things that's big part of your life is obviously Mm. in uh, music yeah um and a lot of people would know you from your singing and your performing at various um, events around town how did Mm. you come to love music how did you know that that's what one of the things that you wanted to do Mm. i actually I don't have a moment where I realised that music was what I wanted to do. I guess it's always just been second nature and just something that I've been naturally drawn to. Like, even just from a young age, growing up in the house, Dad used to work at Quarry Radio and he'd have all of, like, the 90s, like, R&B hits or the 2000 um, R&B hits and, like, he'd just play them all the time. And then also just being, like, completely encapsulated in culture and so much of both Tongan and Indigenous culture is just embedded in music. And so I guess that's always been second nature, just like not not intentionally surrounding myself with music, but just it happens that the culture and my family and the life that I live is just completely, yeah, like surrounded by music. Tell us what the type of music that you create is about. I think... When I write music, I don't sit down and go, okay, I'm going to write a song about this now. I kind of just sit down and whatever happens, happens, and I just go with it. And I often find that you kind of just like zone out and it feels like you have been sitting in your music room for like 20 to 40 minutes, but then you look at the clock and you've been in there for like four or five hours. (laughs) So it's kind of one of those things where you just completely let go of all of your thoughts and insecurities and just let your brain and your heart pour out what it wants and I guess at the end of the day I just write stuff about I don't know being a teenager like going back to struggling with identity people's perception of who I am who I think I am who I want to be all of that kind of just embeds itself in my music 
and I don't go in with an intention of writing an R&B love song or, a, you know, a pop, pop rock, whatever, like hard hitting song. Like I just go in and just do it and just, yeah. Let it pass through you almost. Exactly. It's like you've got no kind of control over it, which yeah. I've heard a lot of the greats kind of say that about songs. They just kind of, yeah. they, they invent themselves for you. All totally. of a sudden it's like, bang, there it is. And go, yeah. where did that kind of come exactly. from? What do you love about music? It's just, it sounds so cliche, but I can lock myself in my music room for hours and just get lost in music, whether it's my own music or other people's music. I think there's just something so powerful about storytelling and music is just like another, another form or medium which you can tell stories and it often opens up people's minds to hear something that they don't maybe necessarily want to hear or makes them feel something that they don't necessarily want to feel. And I think there's something powerful behind that. Um, and also flip side of that is they kind of want to feel it and they're kind of drawn to the music at the exactly. same time. But it sounds like from that description, you're deliberately writing some history into your songs yeah. that, to help kind of educate the community. Totally. Uh, yeah. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Um, so some, I just did my um, major project for Aboriginal studies and those ones I actually did go in for the first time with an intention and a story in mind to write a song, which kind of tapped into something a little bit different to what I usually do. But it was kind of, it was a cool challenge and I got to share other people's stories, which is something that I don't usually do. Um, but one of them was uh, the story of one of the Stolen Generations members whose name is Uncle Bob and he, he hadn't shared his story much, but he came into class one day and it was just very, very chill conversation. We we're just asking questions. And he was kind of a little bit standoffish at first, but then all of a sudden he just opened up and all of these stories came out, all of these, all of these small memories of his childhood of when he was at Kinchilla Boys Home came out. And I was just sitting there with my pen, trying to look as, as engaged as possible, but I was writing these, these stories down as quickly as I could and then later transformed that into a song about his story, his childhood, and I guess the struggles that he now has to carry on his back as a grown man living in Sydney, which is another, a completely different story again. But there was something so powerful in having music as a carrier of people's stories. And that's probably one of my most favorite things about music. Is. And what do you like about performing your music? I know that I've seen you at NADOC um, mm. events, um, various other ones around Sydney, and I'm sure you've done them elsewhere. Yeah. Are there any standout gigs that you kind of loved? Yeah, I loved, I did Yarbin last year, which was just insane because so many people, you know that everyone is there just 100% supporting community and survival day and celebrating exactly what I just said, the survival of all of our cultures and our people. And you find that not only indigenous people are there, people from the local community have all come to just listen to some good music and everyone's just so open and willing to have a dance and it's a massive crowd. So the vibe is like incredible. Um, yeah, and it was just probably one of the craziest, probably, probably one of the bigger gigs that I've ever done and just being on stage literally by myself with my keyboard and just having a yarn with people, telling them my stories and then playing the songs for them was just like incredible, just the dream. <laughs> it's hard to go from there, isn't it, at yeah. 18, to be holding the full stage by yourself, but I'm sure that's just the start of many big stages that you'll be filling in the future. Are there any favourite people you've met along your musical journey so far or inspiration? I, don't, I wouldn't say that I have particular favourites, but I just love going to smaller gigs that are really intimate and you meet other artists who are just trying to get to the same place that you're trying to get. They're trying to share their stories as well, mm -hmm. um, make a name for themselves and are just completely passionate about music and their culture and their people. And I guess the music industry, the Indigenous music industry is really like growing really fast which is really exciting for all of us young young people in Australia who are trying to pursue that but there's just this energy of everyone 100% supports you and everyone wants to see each other succeed and there's no like the, the the music industry can be known as being quite harsh but when 
it's with community and our people. It's 100% supportive and people are in the crowd yelling out, singing along to your songs, even though they probably don't know them. But it's just like a completely different energy to what main, the mainstream industry is. And who are you listening to right now? Um, I've been loving Kate. She is just incredible and her music is insane. Um, I went to her concert in Brisbane. It was just so much fun. It was like one of those more intimate gigs. There was probably a few dozen people in the room, but just good music. Everyone just came to have a good time and have a dance. Um, other than that, I've just been, oh, I've been loving Masego, who's like a new sort of R&B jazzy loop artist. I'm going to see him next Wednesday. So he's on definitely on my top top playlist. Um, and also, like, the Queen, Lauren Hill, is always on my playlist. <laughs> She's a good one to have permanently yeah. on rotation, isn't she? Totally. Um, and is there anyone that you would love to work with if you could mm. snap your fingers and go into the studio and write a song or perform, who would it be with? Or you can have a little ensemble mm. if you like. My eight-year-old self would probably say Alicia Keys. Yeah. Because she was, like, my, like, number one idol when I was, like, eight all the way to like now even I would say but I feel like she's just like a musical genius her her music is art and I think it's changing now and becoming a little bit more artsy and I think she's experimenting a little bit more with her music which I think is really cool and other than that I think I just love to get in the studio or just in a room with young people who have have stories to tell and who are passionate about music, I would literally get in the room with anyone to sit down and create art. Beautiful. Um, as a sidebar, um, I was on a Qantas flight recently and I watched a um, Alicia Keys program and it was, I hadn't seen the television show before, but it was like iconic people in iconic locations. I'm not sure if you've seen yeah. it. No, I haven't seen and, it. And um, so if you're on a flight anytime soon, make sure you check it out. But basically over a 12 month period, they uh, followed her and, did uh, behind the scenes interviews, but also recorded her songs as she was singing in these awesome locations. So she was at, she was yeah. at the Apollo Theatre um, and she was like on a, a boat going around past the Statue of Liberty wow. as like the New York song comes. And she told the stories in the background of it. And it was like yeah. very cool. And I did think of you. So make sure you go <laughs> um, and check that out. Um, now, also, when we were talking about community, I forgot to mention um, Just Reinvest. Mm, yeah. Because we talk about Kimber Wiley, but that's yeah. one of the things that you do. Yeah. And the other project that you've re recently travelled into community with. Mm, yeah. Um, so I'm also a youth ambassador for Just Reinvest, which is an incredible independent organisation that lobbies government to reinvest their funds instead of building more jails to reinvest that back into community with preventative programs. So, um, for example, out... At Burke, they have um, multiple programs running out there, whether it's a women's group, uh, men's group. I think they're thinking of building a skate park, which is like gonna be a hub for the young people. And basically it just targets the problems of the community at the root. So lots of kids were just getting into trouble because they were bored. And the research shows that. So they built, they're building a skate park. And I think the results are showing that young people have been incarcerated at a lower rate in Burke and it's reduced quite a lot in the past two to three years. So I think it's a, an incredible program that is run by community but also incorporates, reaches out to the broader Australian community as well and sort of brings them in on the issues and makes them feel part of the reconciliation and the progress that is happening. And why is it important for you to be involved in projects like this? I think that in Australia we have so many issues, unfortunately, that have just sort of snowballed over time and have become these massive, overwhelming things that we feel like we can't change or even fix or even begin to fix. So I think that programs like Just, in, Just Reinvest are small, small steps to a better future, a stronger, more secure future for our young people. And I think just it's my responsibility as a young Indigenous person who has had the privilege of education, who has had the privilege of being in a safe home environment, who has just had the privilege of life and having choice. 
I think that it's my responsibility to speak up for people who don't have a voice or who don't have the words to say or who don't have the confidence or courage to do so. So, yeah, I feel like it's just always been part of my life to just speak up and to be strong in my opinions and how I feel about the world and how I and my vision for the world in the future as well. And so what is your vision for the future world? What would you like it to look like? Oh, I, don't, I wouldn't even know how to begin to answer that question. But one thing lately that has just really been getting on my nerves is just how uneducated some people are about Indigenous issues or just ind- Indigenous people in general. Like you can have really, really, really book smart people who are, I guess you could say, educated in a more Western context, but when it comes to anything outside of their bubble or anything outside of their world, they actually have no idea. And they don't even wanna take the time of day to even think about what might be beyond their own life. And I think that's something that Australia is quite complacent with and we get a little bit lazy when it comes to learning about other people's perspectives but we actually probably live in one of the most diverse countries in the world. So it would only make sense for everyone to understand where people have come from, why our cultures are different, why some of our cultures conflict, but then also just take a step back and say, okay, your culture is your culture, my culture is mine, and it's okay if they don't always line up or agree with each other. And what would you say to those people who um, are complacent, like you say, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and culture? What can they do to learn more to feel Mm. um, invited into the space? I don't think they're not invited, but um, how can we encourage people to be more compassionate and want to raise their awareness of um, Mm. our modern culture and our traditional cultures? Yeah. Well, I don't think I think I don't think you can change how people feel about the issue, but for the people who feel willing and open to learn about it, I would just say be open to asking questions. And sometimes you will ask questions that might cause a little bit of trouble or someone might not be so impressed with the questions that you've asked, but at least if you have an open mind and an open heart to learn by making mistakes, then you're you're taking a very big step towards a brighter future by just educating yourself and asking questions and getting to know indigenous people and their stories and understanding the complexity and the diversity that's even just within our Sydney community. Yeah. Beautiful. That's good advice. I think we should just <laughs> chop that up and put it on a tile and put it out there on <laughs> social media. Um, some great advice there. Um, tell us a little bit about your social media. Obviously, it's a new platform. You're very mm-hmm. um, passionate about a lot of issues and use your voice, as you say, not just for yourself, but for other people yeah. who may not have that voice. And social media is certainly a place to do that. Totally. Um, how do you feel about social media? How do you engage mm. with it? How, does it connect you to the community, to, mm. to your fans? Tell yeah. us your experience. Yeah, I think I have a, a love-hate relationship with social media. It's It can be the most incredible way of connecting with people that you might not have ever met if you were just in the normal world. But at the same time, I think it can also be very time consuming and it can also, not for me personally, but I know for a lot of friends, it's sort of a point of comparison with other people and it can consume your everyday life or even just your everyday thoughts. Um, So that's one thing that I don't love about social media, but when it comes to my music and connecting with people who listen to my music, it's like the best. Cause after a gig I can go on Insta or I can go on Facebook and I might have some DMs from people who, who, yeah, we're at one of my gigs or want to get in touch, want to collaborate or want to access my music. So it's just, I guess it's just, heading towards the future it's going to be the way that our world is in the future and in the years to come and more and more so even with music now things aren't so much you don't sell cds anymore or you know you don't have your your records or your cassette tapes like everything is online now the music industry is just so quickly changing and you have to constantly adapt with where it's heading so I guess social media is the best way to keep up with that and to keep people updated with your music and your gigs. And you don't have to constantly be sending out emails or text messages. You can just do one post and all the people that want to come see your gig have, have seen the post. 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it also helps kind of expand internationally in an industry like yours, which mm. is exciting. And you have some exciting news on that front, don't yes, you? Yes, I do. Um, so it's been my dream since forever, since I was like a baby baby, since I started singing, that I wanted to study music in New York City. Um, so last year I applied to a university called New York University and the specific school is the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music and I really wasn't sure whether I was going to get in or not. I'm not going to lie. It was one of those things like this has been the dream for so many years and I've been working so hard to make sure that it happens but when I submitted my application it was that moment of oh my gosh what if they don't want me? What if I don't get in? What if this, what if that? And I guess it was just those, those insecurities and those doubts that kind of came out. Um, but then the same day that I got my ATAR, I got my acceptance letter into NYU. So I made it, I got in. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, even now I'm still pinching myself. Like I can't believe that I'm in. And a lot of people wouldn't know much about it. Obviously, it's international school. I've never heard of, um, you know, any of the mob yeah. deliberately trying to make it into a New York music school. Tell no. us a little bit about it. Why did you want to go there? I guess I just, I literally went on Google one day and I was like, music universities in New York City. And I kind of like filtered through like these like hundreds of universities. And I came across um, the Clive Davis Institute and immediately I was like, this is where I need to be. I saw that they had, you know, they didn't only just focus on one area of music, they focused on all facets of it, whether that was um, managing a business, whether you wanted to own a record company or run a record company in the future, whether that was producing music, whether you wanted to be a sound technician, whether you wanted to be a songwriter, whether you wanted to be a performer, like it just, completely got what the music industry is about and they have this focus on completely delving into all facets of music and then also adapting and changing with the music industry because it's it's always changing and like the world it has to sort of be flexible and bend with what's happening in the world and also with technology like so many advancements are happening so music is kind of going from being less instrumental to being more loops and playing with samples. So that's also another exciting thing that they just completely got. And it's like either I was created for the Clive Davis Institute or it was created for me. I don't know which way around, but I know I had to be at that school. And now my dreams have come true. <laughs> and it's so exciting. We wish you all the luck if you get to make the decision to head on over. Yeah. But yeah, how... Um, exciting to be living the life in New York City for a few yeah. years potentially. Yeah. Um, I love that you chased that dream and that you decided you're going to do that and then you aligned all of the different areas of your life to give yourself the best shot to kind of get there. So yeah. that was um, impressive to watch kind mm -hmm. of roll out. Um, but that's a good life skill too. Is there any kind of advice you'd give to young people that do have a dream such as yours or their own dream? Everyone has dreams. Yeah. But, um, I think we need to believe in our dreams and talk big more often and you've yeah. literally just done that. So yeah. tell the people out there um, some of the tips yeah, I mean, I guess when I was little, it was one of those things that like, maybe this could happen, I don't know. Like it was just kind of very up in the air and I didn't have any concrete goals of what I wanted to do. But I guess as I sort of progressed through my high school journey, I realized that I needed to really start working really, really hard. And so I made some concrete goals about my grades because I knew that they had to be pretty spectacular to get into New York University. I completely just delved into music and to writing songs and to learning about different ways to experiment with music um, and production as well, making demos and just being independent in that. Um, but one thing that I've always been sure of the whole way was that that was my dream. And I guess when you have that really strong conviction of I'm gonna do whatever it's gonna take to do this, whether it means sacrificing time with friends, whether that means sacrificing um, having a social life or even just time, to, downtime. Like it was something that I had to completely invest every single thing that I was doing, all of my time, just to focusing on giving myself the best chance to getting in.
And at the end of the day, it was completely out of my control, but I just did everything in my power to make sure that they accepted me and that they knew that I had worked hard to get into the school, that I had I had done hours of research and watched hundreds of YouTube videos about the school and all of the opportunities within it. Um, and so where, where will we find you in five, ten years? I know they're two different <laughs> amount of time, but whichever one tickles your fancy. I don't know, honestly. I just... All I know right now is that I want to make music and that I want to bring people along the journey with me. I want to learn. I want to continue to learn for the rest of my life about music, about the world, about how to live a sustainable life. There's just so many things that are just so exciting to learn about in the world. And I guess I'm lucky that I have that passion to learn. Um, And hopefully I can begin to teach some other young people about how to navigate the world or about small things like passion or music (laughs) beautifully said I can't add anything more to that and uh, what does the real Australia look like to you what is the real Australia the real Australia to me is everyone feeling 100% confident and being authentic to themselves and their culture feeling like they are appreciated and that people understand the history of Australia and where people have come from whether that's Indigenous or whether you are an immigrant or whether you are a refugee or an asylum seeker, I think it just is accepting and knowing all of the different facets of the Australian identity. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, Makesha. And I know we went off music a little bit, but you're just such an interesting young lady (laughs) um, achieving so much in the world. And it was lovely to have you as a guest of The Real and good luck with what comes next. Oh, thanks, Ani Mera. (laughs) Thanks for having me. It was an honour and a pleasure. (laughs) Oh, pleasure is all ours. You've been listening to The Real podcast series. The Real is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander digital media platform produced by 33 Creative. This episode was recorded in Sydney on Gadigal Country. Produced by Jake Keane and Marguerite Barbara. Music production by Jimbler. For more stories and podcasts, visit the-real.com.au forward slash podcast.